Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming today, and you are more than welcome. This is a session on the Tokyo 2020 Games and Osaka Kansai Expo 2025 from the youth perspective. We are Climate Youth Japan, a youth environmental NGO, and we are your hosts for today. For this seminar, we have invited a wide variety of domestic and powerful youth organizations. Thank you very much again for your efforts. In this seminar, we mainly focus on two points, which is to evaluate the Tokyo 2020 games from the youth perspective and to exchange opinions and expectations of young people towards the Osaka Kansai Expo which is going to be in 2025. Um, first, I would like to introduce us the CYJ community and activity for a while. CYJ was founded by youth who participated in COP15 in 2010. Our vision is to realize an equitable and sustainable society by committing as youth to solve climate change issues. Currently, with 60 members from all over Japan and some from different countries, mainly engaged in policy advocacy to relevant ministries and agencies, have a discussion with companies and hold events to raise awareness of climate change issues. We also constantly send our members to the COP every single year. Therefore, now we are honored to have this opportunity to present our work at this Japan Pavilion. Um, this is an overview of our activities. For instance, we hold regular study session every week, as well as the internal study groups called environmental cafes, focusing on input and exchange opinions with the aim of establishing accurate knowledge of climate change from a youth perspective. Other specific activities are field research such as the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant tour with experts and interviews at vegan restaurants and so on. We actively seek ways to interact with other members and take initiative which young people can. Here is today's agenda. To begin with, CYJ will explain an overview of the Tokyo Olympics with our opinion. Following that, Japan Youth Platform for Sustainability, Fridays for Future Japan, and JYC will present their own views for the Olympics. After that, Osaka Kansai Expo 2025 will be a main discussion, and at the end, we hope to declare our hope as the Japanese youth. So now, let's begin with Shiraji's overview of the Tokyo Olympics. This summer, the Tokyo 2020 Games was held for about two months. We have been researching and disseminating information on the sustainability of the Tokyo 2020 Games from COP23 to COP25. The keyword Sustain Olympics has been used as a compound word meaning a sustainable event. We have also introduced the origins and efforts of the Olympic Games and discussed the des desirable management of the Games. For example, there are three dimensions of Olympism, sport, culture, and environment. And for the concept of Sustain Olympics, it is making a youth legacy where we make a legacy in the soft area such as culture and education. 
display our future visions for the world to see, and make what we want real. Also, we have been working with youth from other organizations to build momentum for a sustainable convention. Last year's COP25 was one year before the Tokyo 2020 Games. We presented in detail about palm oil in the sustainable sourcing code and the efforts around the food loss. Thus, as a reputation after the Games, we are pointing out four positive points and three negative points in terms of sustainability from various aspects. First, let me talk about five positive points. The Tokyo 2020 Games was the first ever to be held in a carbon negative environment. The pre-games committee's final estimate was 2.93 million tons of CO2, compared to 3.30 million tons for the London Olympics, and collected a total of 3.14 million tons of credits from the Tokyo metropolitan area to offset carbon emissions. Next, there was an abundance of official related events as a part of Tokyo 2020 involvement program for everyone to participate in before and during the games. This project is open for everyone, and not all, but many of them are related to movements for sustainability and inclusive society. We CYJ also held the eco-friendly candle night relay in Kyoto as an official event. Third, resources were also actively recycled. It is quite famous that metals used at the games were produced with recycled materials. It consists of small appliances, such as phones and computers, which are collected from all over Japan. Also, the committee aimed for a 65% reuse and recycle rate by solely separating waste during the operation. The garbage sorting boxes at the Athlete Village restaurant were subdivided into more than five items. Lastly, the spread of the forest certification system nationwide is also inviolable. With the construction of the new national stadium, forest certification was secured in all prefectures, and PEFC, which stands for Program for the Endorsement of Forest Certification and Certified Timber from all prefectures, was successively used for the stadium. Then, even though there have been great attempts for sustainable games, we can't miss mentioning that there are three negative points. First, there is not enough information spread. These sustainable attempts and even the game itself were not fully recognized by citizens, including foreigners. It is caused by the insufficiency of spreading information through both mass and social media, we assumed. So we would like to suggest creating a website where people can easily access and see their sustainable actions visualized by field. The second one is the unsustainability of the redevelopment of the new national stadium and its periphery. There is no indication of how the facilities will be used after the games. Some are assumed that it is almost certain to become a negative legacy. Also, there have been cases that the proposal to use existing facilities were rejected from a viewpoint of convenience. For the third aspect, we focus on the unsustainability of resources from procurement to disposal. The committee has determined the sustainable resourcing code which consists of individual standards for wood, agricultural products, and so forth. However, it's disappointing that they are not fully complying with the code, and even the validity of its standards is skeptical. 
Also, regarding the code and the other offshore projects, the committee has the system biased toward promoting recycling rather than other three R's. It was pretty often reported that in the Japanese media, many food, uniforms, and medical products are discarded without prior expectations. So we claim it is highly required to secure a place for storing and distributing surplus supplies. This is all of CYJ's presentation about the Tokyo 2020 Games. In addition to this seminar, CYJ is also introducing a more detailed evaluation of Tokyo 2020 Games in the Virtual Japan Pavilion. On the last day of the COP26, November 12th, from 9.30 to 10 a.m., we will be giving a 30-minute uh, presentation in the Virtual Japan Pavilion rural area. So if you are interested in our presentation, please come and join us. And now, I'll hand it over to Japan Youth Platform for Sustainability. So, please start, Jeps, please. 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 So, please Platform for Sustainability or JYPS, JIPS. Japan Youth Platform for Sustainability Organization is a platform for youth on sub national, national, and international levels to get involved in intergovernmental and inter organizational decision making processes. As of the 8th of November 2021, 53 organizations and 578 people are our members, and we have 31 staff members. Our vision is for everybody to have their say in policy making so that an equitable and fair society is realized. For that, we collect young people's opinions, coordinate them establish, manage, and improve an autonomous and democratic mechanism which enables youth to have their opinions reflected in governments and international frameworks. In order to realize a sustainable society, we should not leave anybody behind. To leave no one behind, we need to listen to youth who tend to be marginalized and have their opinions reflected in policy-making processes. In doing so, not only a hand handful of youth, but as many youth as possible need to be involved, and their voices should be heard. JIPS aims to deliver these voices to decision-making fora, and this time we conducted a survey through SNS of people aged 30 or under. I'm pleased to present to you the outcome of this survey. GIPS does not either agree or disagree with the opinions expressed. We're simply delivering the voices collected. The survey was conducted between 20th and the 22nd of October 2021. Carbon neutrality was what the organizers of the Tokyo Olympic Games 2020 had in mind and is to be respected for the 2025 World Exhibition in um, Osaka as well. We collected 161 responses. We used Google Form. As you can see here, there were more female respondents. Their age varied between 14 and 30. 16 to 20 accounted for about 90% of our respondents. Nationality-wise, 146 Japanese, 
and one or two British, Korean, German, Australian, Ecuadorian, Hungarian and American people responded. We asked how interested they were in the issue of the environment on the scale of 1 to 5. 4. Interested and researching was about 50 percent. And 5. Highly interested and researching a lot was 22 percent. Many of our respondents showed interests. Regarding their knowledge level on the topic of environment, five, knowledgeable enough to explain to others and make presentations was 6.3 percent, while four, somewhat knowledgeable but not enough to explain to others or make presentations was 26.9 percent. 33% combined. The most prevalent answer was neither knowledgeable nor not, which accounted for 41.9%. So overall, our respondents were relatively knowledgeable. However, despite the fact that their interests and knowledge levels are high, as to the organizers' intention to make this year's Tokyo 2020 and the 2025 World Expo in Osaka carbon neutral, among the respondents, I did know at all, and I did not know well, accounted for 70.2 percent, while I know well and I know a little was 19.7 percent. Some respondents said, I did not even know that the Olympics had the goal of respecting carbon neutrality. Others said, I do not think there have been any media reports that the Olympics or the Ox Expo are planned in a way. These young people are interested in the global uh, environment, but few of them were aware of the environmental intentions of the Olympics or the Expo. Now, I'd like to focus on the Tokyo 2020 games. Decarbonization and carbon neutrality wise, the youth verdict was I do not rate it and I do not rate it highly, stood at 32.7%, while I rate it and I rate it highly was 7.3%. This survey shows that the Tokyo 2020 Games, in terms of carbon neutrality, was not rated highly. Some positive feedbacks mentioned cardboard beds for athletes and other measures which contributed to raising public awareness about environmental issues. The use of recycled materials and the PR thereof were appreciated too. Negative feedbacks included there were news coverage on issues with bento boxes being disposed of, a huge amount of food waste was a problem and required significant energy to dispose of it. Also, compared to other Olympic Games, it did not pay attention to environmental issues. For example, the majority of food service ser and served contained animal protein, which raised a question of animal welfare. I thought about the amount of CO2 emitted to burn the food waste. They mostly focused on food waste. This may be because the media have featured this issue. Also, voices included, I have heard about something being done about it, but they were not advertised enough. I don't think there was as much media coverage of the management side's consideration for the environmental issues. I have been watching the news related to the games, but I don't remember such coverage. Thus, in terms of PR, 
carbon neutrality and environment messages did not seem to have reached youth ears. As to the event management, I think the games did, did convey the message by using hydrogen energy such as in BRT, but with shortcomings such as food waste issues as a result of lack of planning and the skyrocketing budget for the venues. I cannot say that it served as a positive PR to the public. There isn't any quantitative evaluations about the process and the result of achieving carbon neutrality, which makes the programs against not even a stepping stone for the future generation or decarbonization and meet the goal. Despite some proactive attempts for decarbonization, such as deployment of fuel cell buses at the planning phase, but many plans were scrapped in the end. If the facilities built for the Olympic Games are not effectively used in the future, a lot of energy is wasted. Low feasibility of plans and inability to implement plans were criticized. Furthermore, some other comments included the medals were appealing as they were made of recycled materials, but the uh, quality was lacking. The games used immense amount of electricity and produced a lot of waste. Building the infrastructure contributed to a lot of environmental damages. Next, about the Osaka Expo. Decarbonization and carbon neutrality wise, the responses were that it would not contribute to solving environmental issues accounted for 16.3%, while it would contribute well was 31.8%, almost double the negative expectation. Negative comments included, I have not heard much about the Osaka Expo, and not much is reported. These opinions were heard from use from both inside and outside Japan. The expo does not seem to be very well recognized. About carbon neutrality and decarbonization, one respondent said that it is hard to visualize any system for evaluating the decarbonizing measures taken in the process of hosting the event and their outcome. As things stand now, it can be said that there is nothing the Expo can contribute to solving the environmental problems. Another said there isn't much mention about details on how they will address environmental problems, expressing his or her skepticism about the organizers' intentions. On the other hand, there were some positive comments such as, I hope that the Expo would serve as a role model for the world. I think the Expo lends itself better than the Olympics to address environmental issues, as well as I believe that the organizers would listen to the voices of the youth. So far, I have shared with you the outcome of our survey on the Tokyo Games and the Osaka Expo from the viewpoint of carbon, carbon neutrality. For both of these events, I'm not quite aware of the carbon neutrality messages accounted for about half of the responses. A lack of PR seems to have been one of the issues, and the organizers' ambition of carbon neutrality does not seem to be widely acknowledged amongst young people. The young generation is well aware of and interested in the environmental issues, issues and further efforts on the side of the organizers to appeal to them are called for. Some environmental measures, even when they are known, are not rated highly. The impact of, impact of such measures need to be quantified and visualized to alleviate the youth's skepticism. The Tokyo Games received more negative comments, but the Osaka exports seem to enjoy rel relatively high expectations of young people. Both negative and positive comments about the games need to be recognized and utilized to make the Osaka Expo a successful event that contributes to solving the environmental issues. So we'd like to have Fridays for Future make their presentation. Uh, uh, I am from Friday for Future. 
First, I'd like to report to you about the Tokyo Olympics and the Olympics and the civil movement, focusing on those topics and how we can avoid conflicts between the organizers and the citizens. That is the focus of my presentation. So I forgot um, a slide uh, explaining what Fridays for Future, so FFF or Fridays for Future, is an organization or a group or rather it is a gathering of people who are interested in acting for the environment or climate uh, change. And then to the stakeholders, including government and corporations, we are trying to put pressure or moral and ethical pressures on those players. And we sometimes organize uh, marches and demonstrations in order to cause or enable some of the um, movement and actions. My name is Tokito. So, as to the Tokyo Games and also the um, civil movement, did you have an opportunity to watch the Olympics? At my house, there's no TV. And I live alone, and I'm poor, therefore I didn't really have the opportunity to watch the games on the TV, but a lot of Japanese athletes really shined, and I think they gave a lot of people the hope and excitement. And of course, world athletes, their performance gave a lot of um, dreams and hopes to many people in the world. On the other hand, Japanese people, pre the games, what were their perspective or thinking about the Olympics? So before the games were actually held, this is from a news agency. And 13th of um, July this year, the data was captured. And people who supported uh, the Olympics in the world was 53%. So from the world's viewpoint, it was about 50-50 in terms of support or against the Olympics. But in Japan, sorry, it's the other way around. So let me correct this. So support was 22% and oppose was 78%. In other words, a lot of Japanese people compared to the world population were very much opposed to the games. As you can see from this research, and furthermore, 54% or more than half of the Japanese population were indifferent to the Olympics. So there were a lot of oppositions and socially, it was an unwelcome Olympics. And there were a lot of demonstrations and um, marches against the Games. And first, I'd like to mention the signature campaigns. And 600,000 people signed to show their opposition to the games as represented here a lot of people were very reluctant about the games reason being that this July of course the corona infection was spreading rapidly and the Olympic Olympics should be a festival to celebrate peace, 
to have such an event during the pandemic contradicts its philosophy was one of the opposition re reasons. And as I said, in July, as of July, the cases were increasing rapidly. So if we hold the Olympics, many will be infected, and it might lead to the collapse of the healthcare system, which may lead to a lot of deaths. Was their worry? And also, this additional cost for postponing the Olympics should be used for other purposes, such as social security. So those were the opinions of the opposition to the Olympics. Furthermore, in addition to the signature campaigns, some of the protest demonstrations were held. This was on the 23rd of June in front of Shinjuku Station. About 500 people participated and protested. So many people participated and showed their opposition to the games. For the reasons that was mentioned before, this is infection was spreading. And they were reluctant about having the Olympics in that circumstances. So before and during the games, a lot of um, protests were held. And these are the possible factors. So the organizers such as um, government and the IOC and as citizens, there seems to have been some conflicts and then they were not really communicating with each other. And as a background, the authority to cancel the games lies with the IOC. So IOC had the authority while the citizens didn't have any. And uh, for the National Organization Committee, the risks and losses from cancellation will be incurred by them, by the National Organizing Committee. That might have been what they feared. At the same time, a huge sum of insurance claims settlement had to be paid. And next year's Winter Olympics are going to be held in China. So some kind of international or diplomatic um, relation implications the government or the IOC might have been worried about. And that exacerbated the conflict and also the difference and gaps between the organizers and the citizens. So this kind of conflict between the organizers and, and citizens, I think there seems to be some similarities between these issues surrounding the Tokyo Games and the climate change. For example, well, in terms of bank climate change or energy issues. Recently, for example, in this year, the Japanese government announced a new energy plan, strategic plan, and a new energy mix was announced. But when they decide on these policies, there might be some public comment period, or there might be some open discussions with the citizens. However, they only just listen to the citizens' voices, but these voices are usually not acted upon. And these kind of um, public comments and also um, 
exchange the views are very much limited and they do not really cover all the citizens' voices. And at the same time, this kind of energy issues and also on climate change policies are decided by the government, not the citizens. And then the government seems to be more concerned about the international relations and the cost, economic cost, and also other stakeholders. And then they do not tend to reflect the real people's voices. That is how we feel. And that is the reason why the Fridays for Future toward the government and um, corporations, corporations were trying to put non-violent ethical and moral pressure. So this kind of conflict that was caused by the Olympics, and I think that is, is very similar to what is happening with the um, environmental and um, climate change issues. And I'd like to present to you the 2B picture of Olympics. I think people's voices should be heard and reflected in policies. But in our case, I do not think public comment period is enough to listen to people's voices. They will have to act upon the voices and move to actions. For example, the signature campaigns and opposition and demonstrations, those are the actual voices, and then they have to be acted upon. And that's what the policymakers and stakeholders have to do. The second point is the same. So listen to them. And we have to think of their um, opinions and views as of first importance. And what we can say about the Tokyo um, Games. And so uh, the organizers of these games have to listen to the people and reflect of them onto their policies and management, for example, environmentally friendly, sustainability, and also um, those messages have to be conveyed publicly. And to make Olympics really environmentally friendly and sustainable, an appeal to the people that the Olympics are for the purpose of realizing peace, not only for now, but for the future. However, what we have to be careful about is that we have to avoid greenwash. Yes, you might say eco-friendly, or you might say it's sustainable, but sometimes uh, these might cause some new social issues. So, a real sustainability and real eco-friendliness will have to be pursued in future gains. That's the last slide that I wanted to present to you. It may not have been a very specific proposal, and it might have been slightly abstract, but the Olympic Games should pursue the peace of now and also the peace of the future. So we should focus more on the future, is what I would like to stress here. And in this process, the IOC and governments, the organizers against uh, citizens, this kind of conflict should be avoided. The views might change or differ, and it might even lead to some conflict. 
which is completely contradictory to the philosophy of the games, which is peacefulness. And let's see what I'd like to say is that the host countries of the Olympics representing the spirit of the games need to make decisions based on the philosophy and the vision of the Olympics. Thank you very much for your attention. And followed by that, I'll hand it over to JYC. Hello. We are from Japan Youth Conference, JYC, and the Secretariat of Youth Climate Conference, Riko Komiyama and Aya Hashimoto. We would like to talk about the Tokyo Olympics 2020 from the viewpoint of transport. During the Tokyo 2020, a lot of athletes and media people were expected to arrive, which would lead to lots of traffic congestion. Many measures were taken in terms of decarbonization. I would like to share with you some of the examples. Firstly, Toyota Motor Corporation supported Tokyo 2020 with its full line of electric vehicles, such as the unique version of Olympics designed machines and those developed specially for the event aiming to reduce the environmental impact at the lowest level in the Olympics history. Through the efforts, the ratio of EVs in the total fleet provided is expected to be around 90%, of which the numbers of EVs and FGVs with no CO2 emission are about 500 FCVs and about 850 EVs. That is around 1,350 vehicles in total. It is likely to be the largest in the Olympic history. One example of the Toyota's EVs is called APM. The vehicle is designed to be easily accessible to anyone, including elderly and disabled people. It can be also used for rescue activities. As for other examples, some vehicles are designed to support mobility of security and medical staff, and it is called walking area EVs. There are standing seated or in a wheelchair models, and people, even with disability, can use them depending on their needs. When it comes to environment-friendly vehicles, the mode of transport is very limited. But the invention of Toyota is, I thought, was truly inspired by, the, by a society to accept diversity. Having read this article, I thought EVs, which anyone can use safely, are good for the environment and will be promoted in the future. Also, Tokyo 2020 aims to achieve greener Olympics, one of which examples can be cycling revolution created by London Olympics. During London Olympics, all the spectators expect, except disabled people were asked not to use cars but to use public transport, bicycles or walk. This approach prompted the first the extension of cycling lanes in London and more people started to use them. Tokyo 2020 was initially planning to do similar cycling revolution, but this did not happen. In the past, I was studying about the cycling situation in the Netherlands and learned that since the land is very flat and is suitable for cycling, one in two Dutch people rides bikes. In Japan, there are many mountains and steep hills which could lead to major accidents. But to, but to think about environment, I thought we'd have to promote cycling by all means. By the way, for road events such as marathons at Tokyo Olympics, in order to prevent heat strokes among athletes, it was required to mitigate the heat island phenomenon. Although not used during Tokyo 2020, one company developed water retentive, retentive block called Green Base Ground, which makes it doable to mitigate the heat island phenomenon. 
the block is super water retentive and absorbs surrounding heat and can cope with sudden downpour or heat island phenomenon, which is fantastic. Also, the, this block is made of waste. We thought that the development of such block can reduce damages when natural disasters, such as sudden intensive rain strikes. Since Japan is prone to disasters, this invasion is what Japan needs. In addition, in the run-up to Tokyo 2020, street trees were reorganized. This is to mitigate the heat island phenomenon by, by plants. But because of this, some streets became bumpy and made them less accessible. In our opinion, tree planting is good for preventing disasters like landslides, but not suitable for places where many people come and go, like Olympics. If using street trees, we think the next big challenge will be how to make the space more accessible at the same time. The heat island phenomenon is challenge, a challenge faced by many countries, including developed countries. Governments are taking various measures. One example is to reduce the size of cities to prevent over density of population thus mitigate the heat island phenomenon. In Japan, the population of Tokyo, Osaka, and Nagoya represents 50% of the total population. The concentration of population in Tokyo is ongoing. If, by avoiding Tokyo centralization, the heat island phenomenon can be mitigated, we think it's a good idea. In conditions to mitigate outside of Tokyo are sufficiently prepared, we do not consider the heat island phenomenon would be worse. In developed countries such as Germany, such there are measures such as mandatory green roofs for some buildings, or if you expand surfaces, permeable surfaces, you can get discount in water charges towards the Osaka Expo. I thought we can achieve greening and more decentralization of population, not like Tokyo Olympics, where many people were densely concentrated, but I hope the Osaka Expo will be greener and more earth-friendly. During Tokyo Olympics, in order to avoid congestions through people's interactions, remote work and standard working hours were encouraged. Remote working is good to, to avoid remote working is good too to avoid spread of the COVID-19 as well. Staggered working hours also prevent rush hour congestions. Also, remote work makes it easier to connect with overseas, which makes it collaboration with overseas youth smoother. Telework relieves over concentralization in the capital region. Before teleworking became normal, many workers need to live in the metropolitan areas where companies are based. But remote working promoted, prompted more people to move out of Tokyo. I think this will make local cities prosper and prevent demographic issues. Since teleworking did not become a mainstream in Japan, we look into the British situation. In the UK, during the London Olympics before the pandemic, people were asked to work from home. In Britain, 30% of workers work remotely, which is a very high standard. In European countries such as UK, governments imposed very strict lockdowns and stay home was a mandatory. This did not happen in Japan. In Japan, the restrictions are much lighter and people can go out. Perhaps it is why teleworking is not that popular in Japan. At the same time, working mothers with young children struggle between child raising and working at home. Perhaps if there are some space, not at, not at company or home, but somewhere like railway stations where people can work remotely, then people can concentrate on their work without being too close to other people. This time I shared my thought on transport and roads with you. As you see, in order to solve many challenges on transport and roads, various measures were taken for Olympics. However, all of them are temporary measures and I felt not sustainable at the targets of SDGs. The Osaka Expo is to be held in 2025. From now on, like this cycling revolution in the UK, I hope some measures will be taken to have lasting good influence in the future. In order to do so, I think, if each one of us will have a vision of environment-friendly and sustainable ideal future and make efforts to realize it, the society will change. On this note, I would like to conclude my presentation on Tokyo Olympics. Thank you.
you so much for uh, three organizations and communities. And um, this concludes the evaluation of the Tokyo 2020 Games uh, from youth. And uh, we look forward to the detailed offshore report on the sustainability of the Tokyo 2020 Games, which is uh, expected to uh, be prepared uh, the next spring. And we also hope to continue sending out our voices as youth. Okay, now uh, we have finished the Tokyo Train Training Games, and uh, we think we need to start preparing for the Osaka Kansai Expo 2025. Mm -hmm. And as in the case of the Tokyo Training Training Games, uh, Shiwai J will start long span. Uh, activities in preparation for the Osaka Expo, and while taking over the positive points of the Tokyo 2020 Games, and uh, we need to identify issues uh, to so that we can make the most of our reflections to further improve the sustainability of the Osaka Expo, and so and send it out as a reading case in the world. Then our next Friday for Future Japan is presenting. So, the FFF people, let's go. The floor is yours. はじめましてフライデースフォーフューチャー大阪の小林正道と申します。正道 Kobayashi from Friday for Future Osaka. So, what are we going to showcase through the Osaka um, Kansai Expo 2025? I'd like to make a suggestion and present a proposal about the event. So, how this um, presentation is going to flow? So, what sort of opportunity Osaka Expo will present to us? And the vision and the success of the Osaka Expo, what are they going to be? And toward 2025, I'd like to talk to you about what we expect of them. So Osaka Expo, what sort of things are going to be showcased? I'd like to first talk about the Expo's themes. So this 2025 Osaka Kansai Expo, its main theme is designing future society for our lives. And as sub-themes, diverse and healthy lifestyles for both mind and body, sustainable society and economic uh, systems. And then as a concept, it will be a uh, lab for the future society. So in order to, as to the vision of the uh, Kansai Expo, the SDGs achievement, and the Society 5.0, those are the things that we aim for through the Kansai Expo. So if they were to be all achieved, what sort of society we will have in Japan? So this um, designing future society for our lives, it sounds like a fantastic future that we're looking forward, we can look forward to, and uh, sustainable social and economic systems. If we can achieve those um, by 2025, we can really look forward to it and we can um, coop the benefits of it. And then this is going to be the lab or the experiment for the uh, future society. So, as to our proposals by theme, designing future society for our lives, our lives, whose lives, the management of a pavilion, is it and Japanese organizers of the pavilion, or is it the people who are going to be uh, managing the uh, expo itself, or is that the participants or uh, visitors, or is it the population as a whole in the world? So the theme um, lends itself to the sort of purpose of helping everybody in the world. And of course, all the participants deserved equality and equitable um, 
treatment for um, COP26 for people who were not uh, uh, jabbed. The, job, uh, the, the UK government prepared many vaccines. And then also at this um, venue, there are a lot of people who were planning to come but could not make, make it and then people who wanted to make actions. So this is a reality. There are a lot of people missing here. By 2025, for the expo, the new coronavirus and other afflictions may surround us. And at that time, the uh, developing countries and also countries who, are, who have the uncertainty in their uh, societies will have to be helped and assisted and we should not make it an empty expo. That's what I'd like to say. So this expo is not going to be the technological expo, but more the social vision expo. So 2025 and beyond, this expo is going to showcase what we can make. So yes, the venues itself may be full of hopes and beautiful exhibits, but once outside, the real society is not sustainable or healthy. That's something what we have to avoid. We should not make a make-believe theme park out of the expo. Expo inspires a better future. That's what we'd like to see as a youth. By 2025, what Japan can do. So these are the proposals that I'd like to make. Now we are surrounded by many crises, not only the environmental issues and the pandemic. There are a lot of crises and dangers surrounding us. In 1970, as you can see, the expo was held in Japan, and then the mobile phone was featured. But now, everybody has a smartphone. So on the bottom as SDGs. SDGs are to be achieved by 2030, and 2025 is going to be a very important time, leaving just five years to achieve all the goals. Are we going to achieve all the SDGs and what will happen to all these things, we will have to make sure that they are realized. The SDGs and lofty visions should not simply be written on banners. We need concrete policies and actions to make them a reality. Such endeavors should continue before and after Expo 2025. So as to these risks, we all know what could happen in the future. And climate change-wise, science has already come up with possibilities. And now it's time for action. This theme of a 2025 Expo, its theme and 1.5 degree targets will have to be realized and will have to be actually achieved. So at least Osaka, as one of the largest cities in Japan, should make concrete efforts toward decarbonization, show the world its progress in 2025 and proudly present itself as an embodiment of a future society. Futile slogan is not what we need. We need actions. Thank you very much for your attention. Next, JYC is presenting. So, there is a Nihon Wakamono Kyogi Kai no Mina san, Onega Itashimas. Hello, we are 
I'm Hashimoto and Komiyama. Based on the transport aspect touched upon earlier, we made a comparison with Tokyo 2020. At present, hydrogen energy is being developed in many places. In supply and use in transport, various approaches are ongoing towards the practical use of hydrogen in the run-up to Osaka Expo. The background of this is that Osaka Expo is to be held on Yumeshima and designated as an experimental ground for hydrogen utilization. Against such backdrops during the Osaka Expo, the venue and Kansai International Airport and new Osaka Station will be connected by driverless fuel cell buses. At Tokyo Olympics, hydrogen fuel vehicles of Toyota were used. During Osaka Expo, the scale is much larger. Hydrogen fuel cell vessels will be introduced. The vessels do not emit any CO2 underway and environment friendly. They also produce less noise and vibration, so they attract huge attention. One example of failures of Tokyo 2020 was that Toyota's FCVs are expensive and economically does not work out well. With regards to hydrogen vehicles, in the process of producing hydrogen, a large amount of CO2 is also produced, which has negative effect on Earth, taking this into account. I think the Osaka Expo uses vessels to reduce costs as much as possible. At the same time, the vessels use hydrogen and we would have to consider a negative impact on aquatic habitats. To expand the use of hydrogen vessels and vehicles, uh, it is indispensable to introduce many hydrogen filling stations. However, there are challenges to introduce hydrogen stations, and we only have 135 stations in Japan, which are concentrated in four major cities. One challenge is that it needs massive investment. Another is hydrogen embrittlement, which requires, requires special metal for hydrogen stations. The safety requires a very high and the result and the costs are very high. To realize carbon neutrality, I think technological innovation to reduce costs is necessary and I'm pinning my hopes on Osaka Expo. Also, explosions at Fukushima Daiichi were caused by hydrogen. When introducing hydrogen vessels, we need to technologies to enhance the safety of hydrogen. I hope the technical development of hydrogen vessels will lead to wider use of SUVs and hydrogen stations, which is another thing I expect from Osaka. Instantly, EVs, uh, EVs to be used at Osaka Expo come with a very clever idea. It is a wireless recharging system. In the past, cables were needed for recharging, but by using this charging system, you can start charging just by parking the vehicles at designated places. In dif this difference between to Osaka and Tokyo in transport is that the Osaka Expo, unlike Tokyo 2020, will be held in Yumeshima Island only. During Tokyo 2020, some events were held outside of Tokyo, such as Hokkaido. The Osaka Expo will be held on the main man-made island, so the modes of transport are limited to ships and cars. Since the island is connected by a bridge with Osaka, buses are running, but you cannot walk to Yumeshima at the moment. The Osaka Expo will see more population concentration than Tokyo Olympics. I think it will be very important how to avert congestion from now on. If you take a different viewpoint of transport, the basic policy on the Osaka Expo includes the introduction of Mars, mobility as a service. Mars, in a simple language, is to utilize ICT to promote models, modes of transport, such as buses, car sharing, trains, rather than personally owned cars. Users can access to combined transportation services. With smoother movement within the area, Mars helps to cut down on costs and labor and to cope with rush hour congestion due to an increased population. I think Mars could should be developed and introduced in partnership with businesses all over the world. In order to promote mobility shift. The Osaka Expo aims to realize Osaka's unique city-style Mars. One of the major transportation companies, Osaka Metro, sets Mars as their priority theme. Osaka Metro has a division to promote Mars.
This division takes the lead in promoting the Mars project and also aims to realize the next generation traffic control system for the future society. When we hosted the children's parliament, we came to know this Mars system. To achieve decarbonization, I thought the system would be further disseminated. I hope that Osaka Expo can be a good start point to spread Mars system. The Osaka Expo plans to showcase the technology to utilize biogas from food waste and hydrogen to produce energy. When I heard about this, I thought since energy is produced from waste and utilized in transport, such as vessels and cars, there might be an unexpected connection between transport and waste. The Osaka Expo tries to transform waste to something better for environment. So we decided to look into the relations between the Osaka Expo and waste issues. Disposables or pr plastic products are common in recent years. In Japan, pr the problem of waste is, start, is attracting attention. It would lead to a shortage of landfill space, GHG emissions such as CO2 due to incineration, pollution in biological environment, and other adverse effects. For young people like us, the waste issue is something that substantially affects the Earth environment. In Japan, we have laws such as the Waste Disposal Act and the Basic Act of Promotion of the Recycling-Oriented Society to tackle with this issue. Though through progresses in technologies and systems, I hope the Osaka Expo will work towards solutions of these, the waste issue. Firstly, waste sorting. Yumeshima Island was originally built as a landfill space. I hope the Expo attracts attention on the waste issue. It is planned to introduce stricter rules on garbage separation. For instance, 16 categories of sorting for exhibitors and 19 for visitors. Having said that, more sorting would lead to solve environmental challenges. But too much sorting would increase burdens on workers at waste treatment facilities. It is also difficult to raise awareness of all the residents to achieve perfect sorting. It would be important to keep a nice balance between the local communities and stricter sorting. Also, not only introducing the system, I expect further technological development to reduce GHG and to promote use of energy produced during waste treatment. In the OECD countries, the incineration of food waste is about 20%, but Japan, in Japan it is nearly 80%. Therefore, I hope the stricter sorting system at Osaka Expo would trigger a review in the waste sorting system in Japan. I hope the Osaka Expo will be the center to send out information in this sense. Now I'd like to touch upon the plastic waste issue, which is a concern of the world. Towards the Osaka Expo, Osaka Prefecture plans to collect marine plastics and collect, conduct research and development in upcycling products. To do so, Osaka plans to implement a project to promote a bioplastic business. Through such business, products will not be made from new resources but from waste. I think that this enables us to produce better goods and diverse commodities such as daily necessities will be better for environment. So which could be much more much better for the environment, such as daily necessities as well. The venue for Osaka Expo is Yumeshima Island. It is a landfill island created by waste by a waste treatment facility. Now it attracts investment from large companies and infrastructure is being developed. The, the island is expected to be a center of the future Kansai economic zone. These are our thoughts on the Osaka Expo in relation to transport and waste from a viewpoint of junior high school students. Various new environmentally friendly technologies will be applied to practice at Osaka Expo. Jimeshima has made of waste, but I would be happy if it becomes an island of dreams, not waste. Thank you. So from now on, let us share our views for the Osaka Kansai Expo when it comes to sustainability. The Expo, as a testing ground for the future society, aims to present the world with the designs that make full use of advanced technologies and to provide 
an opportunity to accelerate SDGs related initiatives. Following that, the export operations are expected to have less greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible by those measures such as utilizing of renewable energy and energy saving technology, promoting 3R, using virus plastic products, and some introduction of an even sustainability management system called ESMS. So far, the plan sounds positive, seemingly giving a bit bright future for many aspects of our society. However, there are some concerns we have. First of all, many of the technology to be implemented in the master plan are already in place. And there is little mention of applying new, new green technologies and systems. So the instruction of more ambitious and experimental system should be a goal. The second point is the conservation of the ecosystem of the development place for the expo. In fact, it has been pointed out that a risk of hurting the ecosystem of root beets and wetlands. Wetlands is a migratory bird classified as endangered in the red list of threatened species by the Ministry of Environment. In fact, Yumesima red beans, which is the place of the expo, has become a breeding ground for them. So now, some people have collecting petitions to preserve the area for a crucial habitat of wetlands. Thirdly, we need to make full use of the issues that have emerged from the Tokyo 2020 Games. The issues we mentioned in our previous presentations, such as the spread of information, the use of facilities, and waste recycling, are issues that the Osaka Kansai Expo would also face so that they had better be aware of. So I pass in the other presenter on, online. Yes, of course. So sorry about that. I was right in a different meeting. Thank you so much for the wait, everyone. Um, so yeah, just as Kohana was mentioning, uh, maintain biodiversity and creating a sustainable management system at the Expo is very vital. And while the Expo serves as an exhibition of the state of the art methods of sustainability, we really believe that the future actually lies in the hands of youth who are here and all around the world. So in order for these youth to actually have a part in the Expo, we really need to grow the capacity building um, of these youth to understand what sustainability means uh, in order for them to actually participate meaningfully in um, a more sustainable future. So in order to achieve this, we really believe that CYJ and many of the youth who are here to put together this 1 million uh, sustainability ambassador program by 2025. Oh, I'm sorry, I noticed that I don't have my camera on. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, so this is kind of the project that we've uh, proposed. So what is the project? Uh, do you mind uh, pressing the next button, please, for the slide? Okay. Thank you so much. So the roadmap to this 1 million sustainability ambassador project um, 2021 this year is the project preparation period. So basically we are trying to figure out what uh, program we are trying to use, what is the timeline and whatnot. And then for 2022, which is next year, we are going to raise 10,000 uh, ambassadors in the following year, uh, 30,000. And then the following year, 60,000. And by 2025, hopefully at the Expo, we will have a congratulations ceremony to have raised 1 million ambassadors. So thank you so much. Do you mind pressing the next button again? Yes. So basically what we are going to do throughout this whole process is for CYJ to take part in this building of ambassadors um, by supporting us to teach um, uh, the youth and people who are in different ages to learn the sustainable ambassador program. 
and by understanding, um, you know, participating as uh, an ambassador, they can also teach other youth as to what sustainability means. What kind of projects can we come up with around sustainability in order to achieve a Japan and an Asia, for example, that is a lot more understanding of the grand tra transition, for example. So basically, this is actually in partnership, sorry, I totally forgot to mention, um, but this is a project in participation with Osaka University's SSI, which is uh, currently advising uh, the Osaka Expo. And this is also an official uh, uh, team expo challenge, basically meaning that the Osaka Expo has um, confirmed our participation as one of their official projects. So. This is in partnership with multiple people, and then right now we're in the midst of uh, recruiting other uh, schools as well as universities to participate in the program. So we are not alone in the whole process. We have multiple people who are interested in organizations that are going to walk this path with us. Um, and so in terms of the roadmap, what we are going to do throughout the whole process is to have um, workshops online to talk about what sustainability is. The important part about this program is for students, youth, and other um, population to understand the concept of sustainability. So even if they uh, participate or go into the workforce um, that is in a different industry, it doesn't matter because they understand the fundamental understandings of what is the circular economy, what is sustainability, how do we make sure that our earth is able to thrive even for, let's say, a million years. That would be the ideal situation. So that is what we're going to move on to doing. And throughout the whole process, sorry, I keep on using the same words, I noticed. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, as part of this um, initiative, we are going to make sure that, that the youth are at the very center of this whole initiative. So we have youth ambassadors to learn about what is sustainability. But the important part is that youth aren't the only ones who are able to make this sustainable society, but it is in collaboration with corporations um, and other uh, academic institutes. So we are going to really uh, push for a collaboration for policy making as well as um, shaping the corporate world's sustainability um, agendas throughout the whole process. So the reason, uh, the methodology of doing so is we are going to make sure that, for example, a percentage of the incoming new uh, graduates, or new employees, will learn about sustainability through our programs. So uh, once they go into the workforce, they will be a participant or they will be a major key stakeholder in um, addressing sustainability within the corporate world. And so the important part is that the youth understand sustainability, but uh, also the stance of corporations within their internal structure to also pick up these voices of the youth. And by doing so, the we can truly leverage um, youth to be a stakeholder in the whole uh, structure of the corporation. So right now, as you can see on this slide, actually our efforts towards this exposed uh, new project to raise one million uh, sustainability ambassadors has already started through our Shibuya COP project. And the Shibuya COP is basically uh, a start to an awareness of what is um, the COP, why is it significant, why is the Paris Agreement so important? Because the majority of people in Japan actually don't quite understand or take it to heart as to why we're working on this topic. So we have started um, the launch of this uh, 1 million um, ambassadors by starting off with this project and starting to um, send out the message that we are all in this together. And as a group, we need to work without leaving no one behind. Um, and right now, actually, if there are any participants who are, part, um, who, are, who are participating in as youth organizations, as well as uh, corporates who are here who would like to participate 
in the ambassador program, we are always very welcome for extra help and uh, partnership along the way. So we're looking forward to having your contacts as well. Thank you so much. For my portion, I would like to end and give the floor to Kizashi for the following steps. Thank you. For, thank you for your presentation about the ambassadors. And uh, finally, I'd like to send a message uh, from Climate Youth Japan to all of you. And in recent years, uh, as attention to climate change and the climate crisis has increased, and the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal has become a common standard around the world. And, uh, we have been discussing what we should disseminate uh, as a youth organization. Of course, uh, we still have a role to disseminate the facts of the climate crisis and uh, promote environmental awareness. However, in order to build society uh, in a better direction in the future, we need to uh, not only raise our voices, but also look at the reality comedy and uh, steer, our, steer our opinions based on the feasibility. So we have requests for all who are listening to this seminar. We would like to ask you to actively involve youth and citizens in policy making. It is true that uh, youth have a lot to learn from adults and in terms of knowledge or uh, discussion skills. This is not surprising given the fact that uh, most policy makers are composed of people in their 50s or older, and we are 20s and or maybe younger. But on the other hand, uh, the spread of the internet in recent years has made it possible uh, to freely obtain, share, or uh, disseminate a wide variety of information and knowledge on a global scale. Which has made it possible to think creatively and energetically. This has uh, enabled citizens and young people to easily gather information and discuss policies based on that information. It is also urgent to achieve transparency of the decision-making process and in terms of how the opinions of youth or citizens are used. That sense of conviction is the foundation of, of democracy. And uh, policy makers need to have a tolerant or flexible attitude to actually reflect the opinions of them as an organization that has been pro proposing policies for about 10 years. It is CRGs, and we hope for a so society that doesn't need to lose sight of the significance of policy, policy, policy proposals. In addition, uh, youth and citizens need to participate in those policy making processes on the same footing as exports based on information and data. At COP26, uh, CYG collaborated with Oceanic Corporation, which is a COP26 participating company and uh, providing rule watcher, which automatically collects and visualizes the information on size of global rules to international organizations or com companies or universities and et cetera. And we conduct a send your opinion to the government project and we are working to correct the wide range of opinions on the Tokyo Olympics or Osaka Expo or climate change or climate crisis and uh, across national borders. Making use of the strengths of youth and to use the data as a reading example of empowering the opinions of uh, <laughs> people and citizens. All you have to do is read the QR code and write your opinion. I'm sorry we don't have enough time 
uh, to for for this line now. So uh, if you are interested in it, uh, talk uh, talk to us later. In this context, uh, the knowledge gap between young people and policy makers is being narrowed, and uh, the part perspective that can only be captured by youth uh, need to be shared by many people and all generations need to co-create society without getting too caught up in ideals. The precedents of the uh, citizen councils around the world have proved the usefulness of those opportunities. In addition, uh, citizens' uh, participation in policy making can be expected to improve citizens' interest in politics. The final voter turnout uh, for the House of Representatives election held on October 31st was 55.93%, the third lowest in the post-war period. Citizens are in need opportunities to calm down and think about policies carefully. It is urgent to set up opportunities and places where citizens can participate in policy making processes, like the official citizens councils uh, read by Japanese government. And we believe that the theme of the Osaka Kansai Expo 25, people living uh, laboratory, uh, can be the reading case of a new co-creative society. Transcending uh, generations and uh, positions by making full, full use of technology, gathering information. We also think that it is uh, necessary for a wide variety of citizens to engage in discussions without being bias toward a particular specialty. We feel that in many cases, uh, the active youth who are committed to solving environmental problems in environmental NGOs, we uh, are mainly students of humanities or social sciences. We strongly feel that uh, their long-time activities have made the world realize the importance of climate change and decarbonization. In the future, we think that youth need to discuss sharing different types of ideas from different perspectives in working on making a more ambitious and feasible roadmap or fair transition and uh, climate adoption. Climate Youth Japan is always looking forward to your participation. As a youth community, uh, we will continue to study and discuss every day to make the world better. We also believe that cooperation among youth organizations like this event uh, is very important. We hope that we can continue to work together and uh, well, stimulate each other at times and uh, learn from the adults and we continue to send out various messages. Lastly, uh, we we would like to thank all the people from the three organizations who participated in this seminar and, uh, and the audience and the online participants and, uh, and all the people who were involved in preparations. This concludes the Shiwaji's Tokyo uh, Olympics uh, Tokyo 2020 Games and Osaka Expo 2020, 2025 from youth perspective. That is all our presentation and thank you for your listening and your attention.